figured since Blake was originally doing like a uh, D and D thing anyway, and I have not been cool enough to be included in any of his videos or pod. Like I got his channel here. I could talk about all the stuff they talked about and more, because you know I was there too. So I don't remember what was in the pilot. You're on your own there. You have to go watch it. But uh, about role playing, I don't remember exactly what they said. They say a lot of the same things sometimes. Not really. That's not fair to say. They say a lot of stuff. And I don't. I don't know. I remember. I remember role playing in video ga or in games a lot. It started with video games. I started by playing like Final Fantasy games, and then I got into. Uh, Oh, what was it? Started playing like Kortor and stuff. That's Knights Old Republic. And uh, if you have Xbox, Knights Old Republic 2 just became backwards compatible and it's amazing. You should definitely play it. And that's kind of how I got into role playing games. I played Fallout 3 when it came out and it was amazing. I'd seen in the. Sorry. I'd seen an E3 demo that you could blow up a uh, city with a nuke as like your very first mission after you escaped the vault. And so that's what I did. I was like, I'm just going to do the worst thing ever. And there was the karma system and I was like, oh man, I bet I'm going to be pure evil after this. This is straight up mad I found out much later that Megaton is in fact far benefit, far better than most of the other places. Like a lot of it's poorly spread out, I think. But the house that you get in Megaton is amazing. It's as soon as you walk in the front door, if you fast travel there, basically immediately right there on your left. And it's a nice house. It's bigger than the one in Tenpenny Tower, and I think it's a little nicer. Like, obviously not aesthetically, like, it's more tore up and everything, but at the same time, it just looks so good. There's so much room. Oh, yes, it does work like that. Mag is awesome. How did you not hear me shoot all your friends? But, uh, so that's how I started getting into role-playing in general. And I eventually went back, I don't think I ever went back and finished a full good playthrough of Fallout 3, ever. Like, I remember I took down the Brotherhood of Steel and went back and they were like, how could you do this? And it's like, how could I not? I was, I was the bad guy the whole game. If you didn't see this coming, that's on you. And they didn't. They were fools. They're like, we shouldn't do this. And I mean, now, if I go back and play it, it's a completely different experience because I got that C-51B winterized at the beginning of the game, which is the best power armor of all time. So glad that I have that. And uh, it was amazing. And that's how I got, and then I had a friend that was uh, starting a D and D campaign, and he was like, "Hey, man, this is D and D. You should play this." And I'm like, "I don't know." And he's like, "No, it's fine. It's awesome." And I was like, "Okay." So he showed me his 3.5 books. He had just bought the new edition that came out. He might even add like straight up third edition at that, that point because it was, God, it was like 05 or 06 or something. It was a long time ago, and. Uh, so he we he came over and we hung out and I made this character and he was cool. He was a uh, he was a half dragon, half silver dragon. And because uh, I liked the uh, mohawk that had going on or the the hair thing because it looked like Wayne Static and I was really into Static X at the time. 
So I was kind of build, gonna build this half dragon around that, except he wasn't gonna sing because I didn't want to be a bard. Because I didn't want to be a bard. I mean, they're cool, but it's not really my thing. Oh man, I need to go to the dojo. Or not the dojo, my shit. But, uh, I never actually got to play that character, which is fine, because it's whatever. My first actual character that I played was this guy named Smoke Leaf Hampton Stick, and he was a, uh, Elven Dust Blade. And I didn't get to play him a lot, but he was pretty cool, from what I remember. Uh, He technically would have been a member of the uh, the Heroes Guild because they did that. His Fable, we all played Fable. It was great. Fable was also a game I played. That game was awesome. <coughs> Again, if you have play or uh, Xbox, it's definitely worth doing. Should have brought Eric and. Uh, so I had made Smoke Leaf, only got to play him a couple of times. My next real character, because I'm not even going to talk about my very first campaign, that went over very poorly. But my first, like, real character was a Minotaur named Cromorax of the SS Farscape. He was a uh, Minotaur, because in this world, Minotaur had invented uh, sailing, because they have an eight direction. Like, they just know north automatically. What survival check? No need for that. Not only can I not be flanked, I can also not be sudden striked, which is awesome. Like, Minotaur are awesome that way. And, uh, but they always know north. They just have an innate ability. And so they made good sailors, in theory. And that was kind of a thing in the world of Kryn, if I'm not mistaken, in the Dragonlance campaign setting. And they had adopted it into the world that they were playing, that my buddy Ben was DMing. And this was like a really high power campaign, like, I think the level adjustment limit was like four or five, and we do, or we did not count, uh, We didn't count racial hit dice into our effective class level or any of that. So if, like, say you're a level one Minotaur fighter, you're level three. Which, I mean, you're definitely more powerful than a level three character, but you're certainly not the level eight that your actual effective class level would suggest. Because I guarantee if I take an 8th level human fighter and stack him against that Minotaur, the Minotaur is going to get craned. But I think that's a little more because you'd probably have the magic items or something by that point, and Minotaur don't have any really cool resistances. I mean, they're cool. They do have cool stuff. But they're not terribly resistant to anything. And uh, I'd also made another character who was a, I can't remember if he was a Dugar or a Deep Gnome. I think he's a Zerk Nibblin, which does not deserve its plus four level adjustment. If regular Gnome and Dwarf have no level adjustment, this Dwarf and Gnome are insane. Anyway, uh, his name was Crichton because I really like Farscape. It's one of my favorite sci-fi shows of all time. It's amazing. If you haven't watched it, you should be watching. And, uh... He died. It, it, it was really weird because this campaign had this period of time, which was the 30 Days of Darkness. And during the, like, shadow plane, overlapped more with the material plane. All sorts of cool cosmic phenomena. And we thought that the Underdark characters were going to be boss at that point because, you know, they're from the Underdark. How could they not be awesome during the time of darkness? 
they live in caves. And uh, he died horribly. It was really bad. But Kral lived on because he was the uh, captain. He, Kral came from a noble family. His father was, maybe not noble, but he came from a well-to-do uh, Minotaur family. That and he, his father had, was retiring and gave me him a ship so that I could uh, go out and you know build my own trading empire. And so I was like, I'm gonna circumnavigate the world. First things first, circumnavigate the world. Make sure that I know all the places. And like the first place I went was this place called the 99 Isles. And so. Ben had made this place so that every single island had its own story of some sort. He had, like, you basically just open up to that page in the DMG where it's like a hundred adventure ideas, or the DMG too, and it's just a hundred random adventure ideas. And he didn't open up to that page, but he could have. And I mean, I never actually counted all the islands, but I have very little doubt that there are at least 99 of them. And that's where uh, Blake talked about Savage going in and not being able to do anything because he's a low-level monk falling with a bunch of people who are basically about to be epic. Like this is the thing that, this is our tipping point for sure. And again, high level party, a little bit of house ruling left over from uh, the previous incarnations of D&D, I'm sure. Because they had played since, like, the first D&D campaign settings and stuff. So their rules were, they didn't read probably from start to finish the new PH or the new DMG because I know how to play D&D. I don't necessarily need to read all those rules. And even when they did, I mean... I don't play with all those rules. Not always. Like I've said regularly, I'm not confirming criticals. That's stupid. How are you gonna make me do that? I already hit. Just give it to me. Well, you still get your hit. Well, I just want my crit damage. Just give it to me. We need this, because our parties are small. Oh my god, you stupid rover, I will destroy you! This is when you need the shield restores. Oh my god. So, I mean, that was Carl's backstory. He, uh, he went around the world. He, he actually never made it around the world. He quit playing partly through the 99 Isles because life happened, as it usually does. That's what usually kills your D&D group. Is you know, I. But it's cool, and uh, so after my Dugar or Zerf Niblin or whatever the hell he was died, I think it was Zerf Niblin. I don't like dwarves as much as I like gnomes, even though I've definitely considered playing more dwarves than gnomes. And I hate halflings on sheer principle. They're stupid. They disgust me. I hope they all die. And um, so after Kral also was a ranger, he had a racial hatred for halflings. Specifically the Jaren. The dark halflings. The evil ones. Like, when I got epic I was going to save up all the money so I could make a super bane weapon against the uh, the Jaren. It was just going to be a giant hammer that I was barely proficient in. And, uh, definitely not going to do that. Oh, yeah, we're going to use another starter frame. This isn't actually a starter warframe anymore, but this was a starter frame if you downloaded the game forever ago and picked it as a starter frame. And it won't be the prime version, but again. I'm not downgrading for y'all. I'm just doing it. 
Oh, and I'm also using a new stick today because I got a new skin. I wanted to show it off. I love it. It's the Legion. It's one of the most meta weapons in the game. I built it for Uber range. It's pretty awesome. Anyway, uh, after my my deep gnome died, I made a flintnel, I think. Because you know, monstrous races and whatnot. And uh he didn't get to do a lot. I don't remember his first adventure, but I remember we fought some Velociraptors on like a little grass island, and then I started a grass fire, and our healer killed me for it, because he was also a druid, and he was like, well, do no harm unless you do this thing. And I did that thing. So screw me. But I mean, Fuck those Velociraptors, these guys are dicks. I want nothing to do with them. <clears throat> and anyway, so he died. And then I made Terrorog. And Terrorog was my, that was my, my kitchen sink. He, he was everything that he could have ever needed to be. He was winged, he was goat folk, he was feral. So we had fast healing because we used the straight up feral out of the savage species, which, oh man, you haven't played D&D &D until you've played with that thing. And, uh, Terog would not be stopped. Like, he died because I played him too loose and wild, but he started out chaotic neutral. And I think if you were ever going to be chaotic neutral, Terog pretty much did it right. Like, I got in trouble for eating a bum once. And they were like, Tara, you can't go around eating bums. And I'm like, but he was prey. I hunted him. And they were like, yeah, but he's a person. You can't, you can't eat him. Because he's weaker than you. I know you, we found you on some island. The only other thing you'd ever seen, like, person you'd ever met was a monk. But you can't go around eating folks. And I was like, well, that's dumb. I don't like this. They're like, it's too bad. It's society for you, bud. And so, I didn't eat people anymore. But I lost alignment for it because evidently it was wrong, even though I didn't know it was wrong because I was savage. And then, uh, there's this other party member. And his name was Kalel Combaticus. And Sand Giant. But he was a sorcerer war mage or something. But he would always bang it on the front line like like he was me or something. I mean, yeah, Sand Giant can definitely stand on the front line and take some damage. That's a thing they do. But I mean, you're the war mage. Standing back and throwing spells, let me do my thing. And I can just dislike you because you stand standing back and throw spells. Like, it's just a very confused character. We all gave this guy a lot of shit. And being drunk all the time didn't help. And the, and he had another character who was a, like a monk sorcerer. And her name was Panic. And she was okay. She was alright. She bought all the books. She paid for a lot of stuff. That was cool. But other than that, again, being played by a drunk guy. It was, it was interesting to say the least. Alright, so we went through all these starter frames, so now we're going to Frost. Frost is pretty cool. Frost is like the first defense frame that you're not going to want to use for defense anymore. Once you get to a point. So Terog didn't like Kalel Combaticus at all. Like, at all. Um, like, they'd gotten in a fight at one point, 
and Tarog lost. He was very sore about it because he was a uh, he's a barbarian. I'm not gonna lose to this this cowardly mage. And uh, Tarog was very sore about it, and so he started learning to be sneaky. And in learning how to be sneaky, he came to the realization that maybe I could find someone who isn't very nice that I could pay to kill my friend for me. Tarog would have tried this with, with Craw because Craw had cut his head off on a flop once. Because Craw rocked a Vorpal Axe and didn't go well on the flop. And, uh, so I wasn't going to try anything with Craw because the crew really liked him and Tarog didn't think he could get away with it. But Kalel. On the other hand, like he was, he was a good friend of Kroz. Like Kroz called him his brother and everything. But I mean, Kalel was really drunk all the time, like just dis disturbingly so. And so, I came to this idea where I was going to pay some dude to kill him. And like, out of game, I told the dude, like, I'm going to have someone to kill you, dude. Like, I'm going to have you assassinated. And there's nothing you can do about it. Because I'll be very sneaky. And he was like, whatever. So a new guy showed up, like, to play with us. And he wanted to make an assassin. And I was like, sweet. I found my guy. And, uh, well, I didn't want to come here. Uh, so Kalel was now in my sights and I had a guy even a fall guy as long as I thought I could keep him quiet I could get away with this what am I doing? okay and so yes <laughs> This is a cool quest, this is how you unlock Flem. But I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> Stolen dreams though. This is probably worth repeating. And uh so I had my assassin and I hired him. Yes. Like legit. After decades of searching, the finally uncovered the last And uh So Tarog had some platinum laying around, and I offered this guy a thousand platinum to assassinate Coel, which he did. It was awesome, because we had this one character, and he had just gotten like really paid for the first time, and uh, he, he had a giant party. Not at one of our bars, because we also invented the sports bar. It was awesome. Because Crow was really into taxidermy. I made trophies of my kills because I was a ranger. And uh, so Ardello was having this party, and everybody was getting drunk. It was awesome. And Kalel got too drunk. And my assassin chose this time to strike. Because he's like everybody gets too many minuses. I can, I this is this is feasible at this point. And uh, so he obviously Kalel, being a, an alcoholic, drunk, and everything, is going to have a woman when he goes to bed, a hooker, no less. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I support that as an American, and, you know, somebody who believes in freedom. I think it's his choice. And, uh, so, the 
assassin, his, his name escapes me. I can't remember what he was ripping off, but doesn't matter. My assassin broke in, killed him with a coup de gras, and then murdered the woman when she woke up next to him. And he was like, oh, she did it. And I don't ever invest points into sense motive. So when he told me that, because I asked, he was like, okay, cool. She did it. And the guy who was playing Kalel was very upset. He was like, what the fuck? How could you do this? And I'm like, well, I just did it. That's how I did it. Like, I did it in front of you. Like, you knew this was coming. You knew it was coming tonight, and you did nothing. He was very sore about it. But that wasn't enough for Terrorog. Oh, no. Now he had to, now he had to permanently harm him. So, Wish is an incredibly powerful spell, depending on how you do it. And the way we were doing it is, like, you could always go out and buy a wizard to cast a spell for you. And so what I did is I went out and I hired a wizard to cast Wish a few times for me. Like, this started being my go-to. I'm gonna just wish things. I have 50,000 gold pieces and I use my claws to attack. It means I'm not buying a lot of magic gear, so what am I gonna blow all my gold on? Wishes. I'm a gluttonous heathen. Assassinating my friend is what tipped me over into chaotic evil. And so, uh, I bought a bunch of super glue and I had 10,000 gold coins. And I would glue gold coins to the ground, like all over the place, everywhere I went. Just glue and gold coins to the ground. And, uh, it was awesome. Like, it was awesome. I think these are spy missions now. Because I would just fly to the top of a building afterwards and watch people try to pick up my gold coin. It's like gluing quarters to the ground at the mall, but I don't know if people still. And I would do it in the poorest part of town, too, so that I could watch people, like, kill each other over this coin they couldn't even have. And, uh... So I, ne I needed to continue to fuck with Kalel. It was a thing. It had to happen. There was no way it wasn't gonna happen. And so... I went to this wizard that I went to to make my wishes. And I was like, hey, man. I'm gonna pay you double what a wish usually costs. I need you to make this like work. Like, I cannot afford to have the genie like show up and dick me on this. This is this is real shit. This is in-game shit. And so he was like, okay, I can do that. What do you want? And I was like, I want I wish that Kalel Combaticus's name was always Richard Fluffer. Like, I want you to, to retcon history so that his name is Richard Fluffer and he is so incredibly proud of it. So that way he wouldn't, like, try to hide his name as Dick Fluffer. He ended up saying, like, oh, if you call me Dick, I'll, I'll kick your ass. And it's like, okay. It's still fine. The joke is still that your name is Dick Fluffer. And he's like, okay. And so he retconned, like, time. And I had a joke. And then also, the character, the guy who was playing this guy was also not here for this. He got a will save when he got back to have, like, history be changed on him. But, like, he wasn't even there to defend himself. And he thinks that was wrong, but I wasn't DMing, so it's cool. I would have waited. I was very patient. And I had the gold. Not a lot you can do about time anyway. Like, I went to a mage shop that made sure I was not followed by the person that I don't like. 
And uh, my second wish, because I was dropping fat cash this day, my second wish was that he thought that I was the coolest guy ever. So that way, no matter what happened, I would never, like, I would have a lot of breathing room before he could realistically dislike me to the point that he was going to go out of his way to kill me or screw me over or something down the line. Like, I was stopping him from pulling one of my tricks on me. Don't get got. And it, that one also worked. And he only showed up to play once after that. And then we kind of quit playing the game anyway. But yeah. Terror was cool. And I don't even remember what I made after him. It was like a thigh cream or something with wings. Because flying is awesome. Why wouldn't you do that if you could? You get awesome land speed. You get good armor class for it. Fly. Fly far. And, uh, so we kind of quit playing after that, and I had started a new campaign, and that was my good campaign, and that's where, like, Exia and Barnabas and Blake's infatuation with the Warforged came from, because his Warforged ended up being really good in that campaign, and we really needed him a lot, because he was our sneaky guy in the Special Forces that kind of expected somebody else to make a rogue in and they just didn't but it was okay we rolled with it we had some good times some good death there were like I don't even remember them fighting a uh, a death giant I remember them talking about that at one point but I don't even recall throwing a death giant at them Maybe because the challenge rating was a lot lower than I thought it was, and I thought I would really get him with the, uh, um, oh, what's it called? The Fear Aura, because I have this awesome Fear Aura, and the threat of death is super real with the Death Giant. And, uh, yeah, that was, I mean, my favorite character ever was Kryn. Kryn was awesome. That was a really fun character to make, so I don't think I'd ever played like Lawful Good before. And Kryn was a good opportunity for me to do that. Because this is a really kinda this is Blake's first time DMing and I figured having an archetype around would kinda help out with that. You don't get more archetypical than a knight who basically believes in the prime directive like Anytime we were doing anything, I would just ask myself, what would Captain Janeway do in this situation? And that's what I did. Because in Star Trek, Captain Janeway is the best, in my opinion. Some people like Kirk, some like Picard. I like Janeway, because, you know, it's easy to do the right thing when you have backup right there. And she didn't most of the time. It was rough. Void was awesome. And basically that's what I always tried to do with Kryn, is what would what would a Starfleet captain do? What would Captain Janeway do? And it got real rough, because the moral dilemma, man, like, when, when you get hit with it, like, your friend is dying. He's your last friend. Like, the last person that you started this adventure with, the last person who remembers when he didn't kill somebody. Like, the last man. And, uh, it was hard on Kryn because, like, at one point he was dying and I had to decide, do I let him die or do I use his soul as collateral to stop both of us from dying? So I'm pretty sure I was toasted at that time, too. I was in hell. I don't know what exactly my fate would have been. But I mean, we'd been fighting dragons and being on the wrong end of a lot of it. Because in that world there were two gods and they were both evil. And my character was lawful good, so it was real hard for him a lot of times. Like, why don't you agree with what the White's doing? Well, because what do you do with your homeless population? Because there isn't one. And I mean, somebody's eventually going to become homeless. 
it's it's just the way of the world. Like even in an idyllic society, you can cut it down, but no, you can't be somebody. In theory, I guess. I don't know. I guess I can't prove that because I've never seen it. But I do know that there's homeless in the real world. Except for in like Latveria. But again, not real. And. I don't know. Playing criminals. Playing criminals is tough. Playing Go is really fun. That was the campaign we played with No Magic. He was crazy. That guy had lost his family once. His whole tribe adopted by a new tribe. They all died off. It's like, Jesus. Can't get a break. <coughs> and we went to the most hostile place on the planet. To Shanka. And we went there to make a life. And, uh, like, Tachanka is basically what it sounds like. If you ever played Mass Effect, that's where the Krogans come from. It was, it's not as deserty. It's more like Tachanka before the Krogans invented the nuke. But it's still basically the most hostile place ever. Everything dangerous lives there. That's where the Tarasky lives. Like, everything. Or the Tarask, I don't know. Like, it all lives there. Dinosaurs. No. And, uh... That campaign was really weird because James went evil in the middle of it. I didn't... I didn't understand why he needed to be a thrall herd. Like, there are so many cool silent classes that don't involve you being blatantly evil. Like, why go for the blatantly evil one? That wasn't really evil? Dude, you're taking away people's consciousness and their, their right to choose. Yes, that's wrong. Because it's not like uh, leadership where it's optional for them to follow you. You're basically mind controlling them. And uh, that's evil. I don't care how you cut it. You, that's not like the, you can spin this anyway, because at one point I got stabbed by another player because I shook him because I was like, dude, you have to take this back. You, you stole, and I can't let you do that. We're better than that. We're better than that. And he was like, touch me, I'm going to kill you. And I'm like, dude, please don't do that. And I'm like, you have to take this back. And so he stabbed me in the chest until dead. That was the guy that couldn't take the hint about the, um, uh, oh, damn it, the evil armor. It made him kill people. And, uh, that campaign went really sideways. Um, we still gotta go hunt him down. After we save, to save Team Stranglehold. But, uh... The anti-magic campaign was really interesting. I got always kind of intended on that happening, but I wasn't sure if I was ever actually gonna do it, because the more I thought about it, the more I was like, Jesus. What a hindrance. What a pain in the ass. Because it is, like, you don't realize how much you need magic in D&D &D until you play a game with no magic. Because, good God. It's rough. Because the Scions are all powerful. Assuming that magic in your world isn't transparent. Because, like, in Ben's world, uh, Psionics is just black magic is like I want to say just anything destructive uh, probably mostly evocation or even necromancy maybe uh, white magic's like healing magic uh, gray magic was psionics 
and Carl wear a green sombrero because he was a ranger side nature magic. And it was cool. And, and I was repping my nature heritage. Fuck you, little thingy. Is there a window there? Is that for real? And, uh, I don't remember what I was talking about. Completely lost track. Don't even know. Spy mission got me all fucked up. I don't like spy missions. Oh yeah, anti-magic. Campaign was tough, but Go was fun. Because he had nothing to lose. And like, any time... Like, I was like, why am I here? Like, I've tried to retire this guy like four times already. He is the ranged fighter. And if you've ever played D&D, &D, you know. You don't want to play a ranged fighter, and especially in third edition. Like, your damage fall off is just too high. And shooting people with bows is not viable. And it's even less viable when you don't have magic to rely on to have badass death arrows and shit. Like Navara here. Oh, oh jeez. Oh jeez. But it was really cool. That campaign started out just bounty hunting and then as James became evil it got more pertinent to hate the silence. That was neat because everybody got to DM a little bit there except for James. But I mean he was the new guy still and Russ didn't get to DM. Like we introduced somebody to D&D &D in that campaign with no magic and I think he's definitely enjoying having it in 5th uh, edition, because that's what we're playing now. I think he was definitely enjoying having it in uh, what is being referred to as the Trailer Park Boys campaign, which is an awesome campaign. Like, I don't care what anybody says, that, that is probably the most fun to DM, because, I don't know, I think I've just finally figured out that, that blend of ridiculousness to action because I don't think that the suspense really works like if your characters are fearful for their life it's probably because they're about to to die and you know you need to McGuff or like not McGuffin but you got to do something to make sure that they don't so that the story can progress because major character death or total party wipeout is basically death for your campaign. It's very bad. It's hard to recover. You lose a lot of momentum because now we gotta reintroduce these guys. We gotta, we gotta come up with new motives and reasons for them to continue on, along and all this, this crap. See what I try to avoid stuff like that. But the trailer park campaign I don't think like they're getting really close to that. I think they're gonna fight a uh I gotta find, like, some golem for them, because all they have left is the tin man. I made him last because I looked up the iron golem and I'm like, wow. These guys are like level max five or six. I don't even think we have a level six guy. Like, I'm level two because I made a half dragon and good god, I'm screwed. Like, got like 20 hit points, man. And we're about to go fight, like, an iron golem or something. I mean, I got good stats, but that's about it. I really need a little more than that right now. But it is what it is. Oh, yeah. What's the next part of this quest? What am I doing? Being bad. <laughs> um. Trailer Park Boys campaign is cool. Um. I just made like an NPC healer so that they would have somebody to keep them alive. And that just ended up being me. And uh, it's been a neat campaign. 
Um. Sorry, my controller just died. I apologize. Oh god. But, uh... So they were recently freed slaves. They had all been given citizenship for military service. So I kind of explained their class as well. Like, oh, where'd you learn to do this? In the military. It wasn't like the good campaign where they got boot camp. It was just your ex-military technically like I don't know if you're on the front lines it's up to you to decide what your backstory is if that's what you want for your backstory then that's fine that's what you did but uh obviously you didn't get that much because you're level one what in the fuck how did I miss that son of a bitch both of them uh, so we were recently freed slaves, we were in a place called Cesspool, it's literally where the word comes from because this is pretty early in my history. I guess I should start with the history of the world. Uh, humans were created as a slave race by an evil god, like if you've ever read the backstory for the band Guar, I basically borrowed that verbatim, at least the human side, created from interbreeding of the scum dogs of the universe and apes and so humans were created as a slave race in my first age like the first listed age because it is the primordial age which is the age before man uh, the first age that would include humans lasts for like 1.5 million years. It's made me rethink a lot of things in my campaign, like the kinds of fuel I will use for my my trucks and motorcycles and trains, because in a world like D&D, &D, where dinosaurs are still alive and there's no carnivorous age, like, where the fuck does all your coal come from? Like, you can make natural gas, but coal, not so much. Oil, not so much. So I had to come up with something else. Which I have. It was easy. Just had to be insidious. Because, you know, the world's run by demons. And, uh... So... The... Um, so the trailer park boys are in the first age, like the first age of man, and uh, they were part of the human empire because human actually comes from the, is going in my world to come from the name of the first emperor of mankind, Hugh. He is a... Uh, uh, samurai and he is conquering the world because I don't know very loosely defined reasons maybe he just wants to be famous I don't know I haven't really hasn't been carved into the stones yet but uh so they're part of the human em or yeah they're official citizens of the human empire even though None of them are human, I don't think. Maybe one of them. I think that, uh, whatever Russ made is a human. And, um, so, they got dumped in cesspool, and they found this cave outside town like they were just looking for any work because I was like all right now you guys are citizens and now you have to come up with money so you can pay your taxes and they're like what the fuck because tax time is right around the thing like they're getting really close to the beginning of the year so they have to pay their taxes and they're like how are you going to make us pay taxes dude that's terrible and I'm like welcome to D&D fucking shitty life edition and so 
they uh, started investigating these caves and doing whatever work they could. And they ended up getting a house from a half orc. Yeah. And I. Yeah, I think I named it McCravel, like from the uh, from Harry Potter. And so they got this house. It's trashed. It's terrible. This guy lets his goblin friends hang out and tear it up. They're very scummy. But, I mean, you're living downstairs from the lady on Baker Street. And, uh, so, they, um, they went to another cave and discovered another dude. And then they found out that these caves are connected dungeons, or they don't know how they're connected, but they know that they're in some way connected. Well, they know now, but they didn't know at that point. And they found uh, just a bunch of undead and different stuff. Like, they're based off the Child's Dungeons in uh, Bloodborne. Because at the time, everybody had played Bloodborne. Because it was just me and a couple of guys who had played Bloodborne. And that's what we were doing. We finally get to quit using a bar. And so, uh, we, um, so we went to go get this house, which is in a town that was not accessible. And then I think they started working for the mob because they just, again, needed to make some money. Oh yeah. Cause they were going to steal an airship because they heard about a good score and they could make six figures in gold. Which is a pretty sweet deal. That's like hundreds of thousands of dollars in, like, real money. Yeah, it was a half a million in gold. That's what they were going to get. And split, like, three ways. That's pretty, pretty goddamn good money. And so, uh... They were going to steal this airship from the first emperor of man at level one and so I came up with these story sections or like like heist setup basically because I had played uh, GTA 5 and I was like this works this this can work at level one I didn't set up this impossible task at level one I'm like it almost got to the point of me backpedaling and I was like no we can do this there's there is a way I just gotta be clever about it and that's basically how I forced myself to master the low uh, level campaigning. Is how am I going to make this interesting? So they had to find this thing so that they could make a forge for this, uh, their thycreen. Or there's a thycreen that's going to be their pilot. Because thycreens also have an eight direction sense. So they make excellent sailors. And plus, I mean, they would make excellent sailors anyway because of their incredible jump check and their high dexterity. Like, Dykeman are one of the coolest races in the Indy, next to Goat Folk. And, uh. What is stuff? So. Um. They stole that they had to get a forge for this thigh crane so that she could leave her gold dragon egg behind to be our pilot for this job. And that was going to be like 12 grand on its own, like the forge before you got into the, uh, like before you even considered the heating element or any of that shit. Like they had to get a magical billows for it so that it would stay hot enough for the full amount of time that they needed it to be. And, uh... So... Man, this dinner looks, looks different from the regular one. I like this one better. Um... So... 
so they got the thigh cream to work for them. And they got the frozen flame, which is a thing from uh, Chrono Cross, which was a uh, it was a Square Enix title from I want to say like 2000, 2001, probably 2000, maybe 99. It was early 2000s if it was. Um, it's definitely before 01. It was pre 9/11 because everything changed. Uh, so they got the frozen flame, which is evil, by the way. It was part of Lavos in the game, and so I was like, well, this thing definitely still is evil. And in my long history of the world, I have this character named Tyranax, who is a gold dragon, who became like a tyrant and started the Dragon Wars. And they helped birth him. Because, you know, reasons. And, uh... That's been a fun campaign. They've really adapted to being low level pretty well. I don't think anybody's died yet. Our barbarian feels, our rage mage feels really strong because he, uh... we go. We already did this one. Technically. I don't think... Kepler is the one that's impossible to do. This is an impossible mission. I've only completed that once. Oh, I'm not doing a spy mission. I just did a bunch of those. New capture. Regular capture. And, uh... Yeah, going to, um... After a little while, I kind of ran out of ideas for that campaign. Like, I did a murder mystery. That was fun. Uh, they had a mimic working for them that they had basically fought in their first encounter. It was a mimic. And they captured him, and that was like their guard. Like they have a guard dog that can always watch them. And, uh... That's why Blake thought it was like Trailer Park Boys things, because like there are a lot of in jokes, I guess. That if you just watch it for the first time, don't make sense. But I mean, you just gotta kind of. A lot of those things don't make sense in Trailer Park Boys. That's just the way that they are. Like they're supposed to be white trash, but not just regular white trash. Canadian white trash, which has got to be worse. Not to hate on the Canadians, they make Warframe they're cool. But, uh, after the murder mystery and they escaped the country, I didn't really have anything planned for. I didn't want to just rush through the dungeons because I wanted that to be like an ongoing thing. But I needed to give them like some type of bone so that they had some idea where to find the rest. And, uh, so I was like, well. They're gonna get hit by a freak snowstorm and go to Oz. Cause I like the Wizard of Oz. It's a, it's a cool story. I had played in Wonderland before in Blake's campaign and it worked really well. It was very enjoyable. And I was like, maybe I can do something like that. And so I did Oz. And uh... Oh man, it was, it was pretty trashy Oz. Like, the Scarecrow is like this pyromaniac uh, miniature Wicker Man. Like, I used the Wicker Man and just shrank him down. And so he killed birds. Like, birds would land on him, he'd grab him, stuff him in his chest, and light him on fire. And that's his thing. And I think I made him a clay golem when they fought him. Just for simplicity. With a, with a fire cone. It didn't go very far. And he was crazy. He was fun. The, uh... The Tin Man, I guess, was just some... 
the guy that was stuck there. He was chopping wood for his master who had died like a long time ago. And uh, like they scared the piss out of the Cowardly Lion. They almost didn't meet the Cowardly Lion because they, uh, they, they scared him too bad. Like, like much big manies. And, uh, yeah, that was, it was a trailer park campaign. And they got to Oz, and the wizard was like, hey, you go kill the Wicked Witch. I'll, I'll let you, I'll take you home. I, I might be able to do that. You should leave those ruby slippers here. They're like, we'll leave one, and we'll keep the other. And so they went to go find the Wicked Witch, and she had turned into the Good Witch. Turns out she was just uh, having a bad day when they met her before. I mean, they did just kind of run over her sister, so very understandable, in my opinion. And uh, so, yeah, they did that. It was cool. And then they found out that the wizard was actually the bad guy. And they were like, oh shit, I didn't see that coming. I'm like, haha, got you. And so they were on their way back and they fought the Cowardly Lion, who's just like a were lion. They fought uh, the Scarecrow, who I, I think that fight hurt him more than anything. Like, that broke their little hearts. Fucking murder hobos that they are. And, uh,. It was just awesome because that's what I want. I want them to care about the people that they're fighting against and for. And uh, they didn't get to fight the Tin Man. And I still haven't even written up the wizard yet. But I do plan on doing it because anything could happen. Somebody might miss a week and it's like, oh, well, let's just do this thing. And it's like, okay. And uh, they actually didn't get paid at all for the uh, heist because the dude had fallen in bad with some Roxashas that gave him the job and the Roxashas were like, hey, part of his crew, you owe us this money too. And they were like, fuck, why are we doing this if we're not getting paid? Because you'll die otherwise. And so that's what they did. They did it. And uh, then they did Oz. I wasn't even going to send them home after that. They are going to get screwed over and end up in Agrabah with uh, Aladdin. I still plan on doing that. That'll be fun. Because they'll be complete outsiders. I think that story would be a lot different for a complete outsider. Because they're not part of the royal family. They're not... Uh, like, they don't work for anybody. They're like, wow, Aladdin, you're kind of tricking this girl. It's not cool. You got this genie enslaved to you. It's also not very cool. Because it's not. You should have just freed the genie with your first wish and then taken slightly limited power. You'd have been your friend, maybe. Genies are not usually that nice in D&D. The, uh, the Afrit are actually a slaver society. And Jin can't grant wishes in my world, so... Jin's are all pretty worthless. The only guy in my world that can grant wishes is... There's this one pit fiend, and he is the first pit fiend, and he can grant wishes because... You know? Pit fiends grant wishes. They do that once a year. That's a special ability they have. That's why I like Pit Fiends. And I thought that would be a neat character. So yeah. I don't really have anything else about uh, flushing out characters. Like, it's basically just grab something that sounds cool and do that. Oh, jeez. A lot, uh, you could, uh, a lot of characters that I make are borrowed from something that I like, 
generally something that other people are not familiar with so that they can't tell me what a shitty job I'm doing. And they're like, oh, I don't think this guy would do that. Well, I don't think whatever. Your dick. The next thing I guess they talked about was uh, how to get aligned or alignment in general. And uh, alignment's one of those things. It's useful until it's not. Like, until you want to have fun, it's great to be lawful good. Because lawful good characters, you gotta be a little careful about how they have fun. You can't go around just breaking the law. Breaking the law, breaking the law. Oh, I'm doing that. No fear. Uh, lawful good's the best alignment because you know exactly what you need to do at all times like it's not oh what would be more evil what would be more neutral what's more chaotic nope you'd be lawful good you do the right thing every time do what superman would do do what captain card would do or janeway or whoever like you just do that thing that you know you're supposed to do uh neutral good is also pretty easy to play just generally don't be too bad don't be a dick you can have a little mischief but uh I mean, you don't have to worry about law breaking, which is always nice, because breaking the law is fun, especially in D&D where you're allowed to break the law, basically without repercussions. I mean, there are repercussions, but you're not going to jail, which, you know, is awesome. Not going to jail is awesome, that is. Uh, Probably the funnest alignment to play would be like chaotic That's evil though, because just being outright murderous is fun. Like you do have to have a group that's okay with it, because you can be de very detrimental to the gameplay itself if not everybody's on board for this lawless, reckless ride that is a chaotic evil character. I don't want that new thing. Thank you. What the fuck? And, uh... Yeah, party permitting chaotic evil is probably the most fun alignment to play. After lawful good. Which I just like because it's easy to know what you're supposed to be doing. Is he dead yet? Where do you go? Where did you go to the sergeant? You twat. Um, I don't have a lot to say about alignment. Use your best judgment. They're testing to tell you what alignment you are, but you're probably just neutral because apathy is easy. It's easy to just say, oh, well, it doesn't affect me, it's not my problem. Because, I mean, it is. You can do it all the time. What the fuck? You son of a bitch. I don't even know why I'm hacking this console to open it oh. One, it's pretty, pretty cut and dry. And if you're playing a newer edition of D&D, &D, you don't even have to worry about alignment. Because it doesn't matter. Wait, it's probably still on your character sheet, but it doesn't matter. There aren't prerequisites that require specific alignments. It's just not a big deal. It just matters if you're playing Paladin. Don't be a dick. That's easy. Just don't do it. Talk about content of my character races. Oh man, picking your race in DD is fun if you do not have restrictions. If you have restrictions, eh, I could take it or leave it, I guess. Uh, my favorite race in DD is the goat folk, and it is because of this incredible ability they have called Pack Fever. 
what Pack Fever does is if you have a goat foe within 30 feet of you, you get a plus two to your strength and constitution. And it's implied that it stacks. So a goat folk army would literally be unstoppable and the most devastating thing on the planet. Because there's nothing you can do about it. They're just all so strong and so tanky. And yeah, when one dies they all lose a little bit of hit points, but I'll eat that one hit point per hit die. Because my my other 30 friends are still here. We're gonna win. Oh, don't want photos. Do this survival real quick. Because I'm pretty sure to get to series you have to have made it to the void. No? Oh, cool. We just gotta fight our way over here. Sweet. Well, we're not gonna do that. We can do that. But, uh. Yeah, what was it? What was I talking about? God damn it. Doesn't matter. Not alignment, because alignment was dumb. It really does only hold you back. Oh yeah, races. The goat folk are the best. Following that, definitely the thigh queen, because the uber jump is awesome, and the just intuit direction is awesome, and, uh, but an armor class is listed. It's a dash. Minotaur never caught off their guard, even asleep. And not a lot of people can say that, especially in D and D. If you're going with just like player's handbook book races, then humans every time, all day, every day, all the way. Humans are so OP because they get no minuses. And they get that bonus feat. And bonus feet cannot be stressed enough how important that can be. Especially in like third edition. In later editions, being human is not as impressive. The extra skills are useful in fifth from what I've played. But I'm playing a rogue. So that's just I get a lot of skills. I wanted to make a very skilled martial character because martial is generally easier to figure out than learning a bunch of new spells and all this other crap. Man. Run this your defense. So, oh, damn it. So, uh. I will, uh be back on in a little bit and I'll see you guys then. <laughs>